Okay, so this is the first of many talks before you will all be quite sick of me. Uh, so of all the many upcoming talks, uh, it was done in collaboration with a large group of people, uh, Ben Ashbaugh, Mike Kinsner, uh, now formerly of Intel, uh, Stefan Larson, Greg Luke, the spe Sickle Spec Editor, uh, Roland Schultz, and in particular, this presentation was mostly put together by John Pennycook. Uh, and we also had Gordon Brown from Codeplay uh, contributing as well. Okay. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about trying to unify SQL and C++. So there's been a lot of thought about how we can try to keep things very c y and take advantage of new features that are coming to C++. And in SQL, we have this notion of groups. In particular, today we have work groups and subgroup, subgroups. But hardware keeps evolving and hierarchies get more complex. So we've thought about what, what's a nice way to try to handle this and be future-proof so we're not constantly having to make new additions. So we thought about what, what our, our deal would be, and that would really be a group concept. And when I say concept, I mean the, the actual C20 concept mechanism, not just an intellectual idea. And we think this idea of a group concept could be very useful because uh, it could solve a lot of problems in SQL. And it could also enable us to map nicely to things in SpearV or other programming models like CUDA cooperative groups. So this concept could let us do several things. Uh, first, it can give developers a way to define algorithms that can work over any type of group. Today, if you wanted to do this, you'd kind of have to either do some weird templating or specifically hard code it for either the SQL work group or subgroup types. So we'd like to be able to build this convention for kind of device side code, which improves programmer productivity. Uh, secondly, we think that a logical and flexible grouping could replace the hierarchical parallelism model that's in SQL today without having to abandon the ND range execution model. So you could define uh, new ways to create groups uh, through various mechanisms, either kind of fixed partitions of certain sizes or logical partitions that could depend on uh, characteristics of your actual application or your hardware. Uh, another problem we think this could help solve is it could give programmers a way to write group algorithms that can be safely used in diverged control flow. In SQL 2020, the group algorithms have this requirement that they all have to be called in converged control flow due to limitations in implementations and different hardware capabilities. Another way we think we can use this is we think it's possible to discover dynamic runtime groups uh, of several work items opportunistically. Uh, one simple example of this could be, give me a group that consists of all the you know, threads or SIMD lanes that are currently active in control flow. And then the fifth thing we think this can be really useful for is it can provide a nice flexible mechanism to describe the uh, describe your hardware or the execution model that you're trying to target. So the rest of this presentation is going to walk through the steps we could take to try to evolve SQL towards this ideal. And we'll highlight problems that we need to address along the way. So step one is we're gonna take a look at the current SQL work group today and see what we can do to kind of address developer feedback. So it, it's important to look backwards as well as forwards. So if there were anything we could change about uh, the sickle group, if we could, what would we want to change? So we'll start with a quick recap of kind of what a, the group lets you do. It has kind of several type aliases that are required to define group algorithm interfaces. It has a memory scope that's required in order to use group barriers. 
and it has a lot of uh, utility functions that you can use uh, to identify the work items index within the group and the group index within the implicit parent group. So we have a strong desire to keep this interface basically exactly the same, uh, but to support a group's concept. And we don't want to cause any backwards compatibility, uh, compatibility issues with SQL code that's already out there. But some of these definitions do cause some problems. So it would be nice if we could rename some things uh, for one, uh, it's unfortunate that the work group is actually just called a sickle group. It would be a little nicer if it were called a work group, because it would kind of be more explicit about what that actually means. Uh, if you read the sickle spec or the open sale spec or the Spear V spec, they all explicitly talk about work groups, not groups. And even worse, in the sickle spec, the word group is often used to mean either just a group the actual group class or a group of work items in a more kind of uh, abstract sense. Uh, also, based on feedback, we've run into issues where a lot of times developers don't realize the get local ID identifies an item. Uh, and so there's questions about, you know, what is the ID local to? Is it still a group ID? Uh, so if we renamed that to like get item ID, we think that the contrast between that and get group ID would be more obvious. And we think if we could make these changes, it would make Sickle easier to teach in the long run. So for the rest of these slides, we'll try to use these hypothetical new names just to keep things simpler. So next we'll get into uh, some use cases and potential new group types that could exist to it can, it, in this, con in this idea of a group concept. Uh, there's a lot of different group types to get through, so we won't spend a ton of time on any of them. Uh, and a lot of the code samples will be kind of de deliberately quite naive, uh, just so it's simple and easy to understand and the details aren't really important. So the first use case is around device-wide barriers and algorithms. So in SQL 2020, you really need a new kernel launch to act as a barrier across all the work groups. Uh, and we have a little pseudocode here that could show how you could implement this, uh, a reduction using you know, log two end kernel calls. So we have basically a loop that calls parallel four a bunch of times. And after each of these parallel four calls, there's basically a device-wide synchronization implicitly. Uh, but it would be nice if we could write this in a kind of cleaner way that didn't have so many kernel invocations. So if you had something like a root group that represented the entire uh, ND range or grid of your execution, uh, you could potentially write it something more like this, where you have one parallel four call, uh, where you get a reference to your root group, and then you can have your loop inside your kernel and use this root group to perform all your synchronization. So in this case, we have a call to group barrier but on the root group saying we want to synchronize everything, not just a work or particular work group. And if you kind of t take this a little further and make it more complex, this would give you the ability to do things like uh, use work group local memory across different iterations of the loop, potentially improving performance. Mm -hmm. So that's the first possible use case. Uh, the next would be a way to support arbitrary hierarchical parallelism. So in SQL 2020, the user is of course free to try to use arbitrary index arithmetic uh, and try to keep track of things themselves as a way of creating abstract hierarchies. But if you do that, the implementation really has no clue what you're doing and it's kind of up to you to make sure that everything is right. However, with something like uh, a fixed size partition, uh, you can make this very explicit and known to the implementation. And then the implementation could help you out with things like barriers and your different group algorithms. Uh, so in this simple example, we introduce a notion of a fixed size partition of, uh, of size four, and then we can perform the uh, group reductions uh, over these partitions of four items. And 
these fixed size partitions can be very useful in particular applications where you, the application may need to deal with a certain number of elements at a certain point. Uh, so one comparison to the hierarchical parallelism that exists in SQL today is that the current SQL hierarchical parallelism model is, it, it's fixed. It just defines these two levels and that's it. But with these fixed partitions, they have an advantage that you can partition a partition. So you can kind of keep going and create your own arbitrary hierarchies. And it's all expressible inside the ND range model. So the next use case would be to support divergent control flow. Uh, like I said, in the SQL 2020, there's this requirement that group algorithms be called inside converged control flow. And sometimes that can require kind of heroic gymnastics in your code. Uh, so in this example, all work items must call reduce and must provide inputs that won't uh, affect correctness. So in this case, you have to take special care to try to, you know, if a work item is inactive, you need to have it set to the identity so it doesn't affect the result. But if you had some type of logical uh, partition that you could create based on a condition and then use an algorithm over that partition, you don't have to worry about this because only the work items that are actually active will participate in the group algorithm. Uh, yeah, and this and so things like this uh, are potentially very flexible. And if you think about how you can implement these types of things, uh, some of these group types could potentially be implemented in a library layer, but others not necessarily. And this is one where we think it you can't really do it efficiently in a library because the implementation really needs to know how to communicate between arbitrary members of the group. Um, so we, we the previous example showed how you could handle divergent control flow in kind of a very explicit fashion with a logical group based on a, a certain condition, but you could also handle this in a more implicit fashion. So we have pretty much the exact same example as before. Uh, we have how we would do it in SQL 2020. Uh, but another way to do it is to use something we call a tangle, where you could write your loop and just have your normal if condition at the outer scope, and then say, well, just give me all the diverged items. You you entangle all these threads that happen to be currently executing in this branch, create a uh, group over it, and then you can invoke your group algorithms over that group. The tangles basically have the compiler automatically insert code to track the divergence and ensure that things are correct and reconverge when appropriate. Our next use case is uh, what we call opportunistic or discoverable parallelism. So in SQL 2020, there's not really an equivalent of this. Uh, so for this case, we'll actually use a CUDA example. Uh, so this example here is a pretty common pattern for aggregated atomics, uh, where you have a group of threads that are participating in a computation and they're all trying to atomically reduce or sum up something. Uh, but you know that, or you could get better performance if you can have them communicate with each other and then have one, one of the threads at the end form the actual atomic modification. Uh, so in CUDA, you can use that using cooperative groups. You can create a group that's your coalesce threads, uh, perform a reduction on that, and then you can pick uh, the first thread in that group and have that thread actually do the atomic add of your sum to your memory location. So if we wanted to do that in SICL, we could do something very similar by uh, defining an opportunistic group that acts very similar to the uh, CUDA cooperative group. And our code looks pretty similar to the CUDA case here. Uh, we create our opportunistic group, call our SQL 2020 group algorithms over that group. And then we can elect a, a leader in that group. It really doesn't matter which item in the group it is, just only one of them. And then that one item will perform our atomic update. Uh, so in, in this case, the semantics are actually fairly loose. So this is the type of thing that we think actually could be done inside a library. 
uh, an opportunistic group just has to have some work items in the control or just has to be some of the work items in the control flow. And you could always legally implement this by just being one work item, for example, may not be performant, but it would be correct. And we have a lot of people here who are experts at getting high performance on supercomputers. So they often care very much about the hardware characteristics of the hardware on which they're running and want to tailor their code to that. Uh, so we think the group mechanism is also very useful if, if that's your goal and you want to be able to partition your code kind of along hardware boundaries. Uh, so Sickle 2020 has our work groups and subgroups, but with all the new types of hardware coming out, we see the hard the hierarchies getting more and more complicated. You know, CUDA recently added things like clusters, and I'm sure different hardware is going to add all kinds of different uh, things as well. And as these hierarchies get more complicated, uh, if you try to sort it all out in your code, it becomes harder and harder to kind of manually compute the indices for everything, and and to do that in a portable way across different types of hardware. So we think a potential solution for this is the idea of a scoped partition uh, where you can kind of uh, take a, an existing group and then partition it up based on a different view of your hierarchy. So the work group and subgroup are kind of legacy things in SQL. So one thing you could do is you could say, I want to take all the work items I have so we can represent that with a root group. And then we could want to split that group up into all the subgroups in the work group. So we can create a scoped partition uh, at the subgroup level out of this root group and just get all the different subgroups of all the potential work groups uh, in the computation. And then we can identify also these subgroups based on their index in that global partitioning, not just their local partitioning inside the work group. So we think this is useful because there's less need for kind of work group, subgroup, uh, specific, d these dedicated classes for these things. We can start with one group at the top and just give you the ability to kind of divide it up uh, as it comes. And this is nice because it allows multiple application driven views of the underlying hardware. You can divide root groups into work groups and then into subgroups or just skip the work group entirely. And like this example goes straight into subgroups. Okay, so hopefully by now we've convinced you that extending the, number, the uh, types of groups expressed in SICL and having this idea of a group concept is useful and would be a good thing. Uh, but now we have lots of groups to reason about and we need to create our abstraction to pull it all together. So let's go back to this idea of a concept and figure out what that looks like and how we can use that to make code simpler to write. So, uh, our first concept could just be a an abstract group of work items. And if we had this, then you no longer need to be concerned if something is one of the SQL provided group classes. Uh, anybody could define a, a class that implements these functions and libraries would be able to work correctly uh, on that. So in this case, we define a concept called an index of ind uh, indexable item group. It looks very similar to the existing work group and subgroup classes. It has these alias types. Uh, it has these index functions to tell you, you know, which item you are in the group. And so yeah, like the work group would satisfy this concept, the subgroup class would satisfy this concept, and users would be free to write their own classes that would could also satisfy this concept. So that's one idea. But you could also have a layered approach to concepts. You could have kind of simpler concepts and then more elaborate concepts that build upon them. So the first concept was just a group of work items and the ability to kind of index them inside the group. Next, you may want a group of work items that can support a barrier across it. Uh, so we could define that by defining a new concept here that we're calling a coordination item group. And we're just going to say this requires that uh, your group actually also be an indexable item group. So we inherit all of those characteristics from that concept. But in this one, we add a few new things. We add back our memory scope. Uh, we add the ability to 
kind of create a, a leader. Uh, and we have the re requirement that you be able to support the group barrier. And so that's a potentially nice thing. And you can have some groups that can synchronize and some that don't necessarily have to. Okay. So next we'll get into uh, kind of future work. There's some unresolved issues and questions. So the, the first thing really is just a, a request for feedback. You know, we really would like to get answers from the application experts and users uh, about you know, which group types would be the most useful? Uh, you know, what should we call these things? Uh, and, you know, do they all need to be able to do all things? Or can there be holes that the user could plug in uh, in certain cases? So one problem is that we, we have a lot of group types now. And all the group types that we've presented in this talk, we actually have already implemented. And if you want to try them out in DPC++, uh, they're available as an experimental in implementation. Uh, so please try them out. Uh, tell us which ones you think are useful, which ones we should prioritize, and which ones we should try to get into the next version of Sickle. Uh, and then, of course, problem two is that bike shedding is always fun. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could call this concept a group, but that name's already taken in the spec. Uh, should we come up with something else? Is it worth the pain to change uh, group so we can use that for the concept? Uh, we'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. So wrapping up, uh, we presented a lot of different group types and kind of our, our three-step plan on how you could extend Sickle to reach the idea of the C++20 concepts to represent groups of work items. Uh, we think if we added this to the spec, it would be very useful because it would both improve the teachability of the existing group function, func uh, existing group group functionality, all our group algorithms and synchronizations. Uh, we think a lot of these new group types have a lot of value and are particularly useful for different use cases like we've shown. Uh, and we've sketched out some potential concepts that we think would be nice ways of expressing all these things. So like I mentioned before, uh, we need your feedback. We don't want to rush this. It's critical to ensure that we don't create the concept too soon uh, because we may have not thought of something. We may have missed something. Uh, and like I said, we do have early implementations available today. So please kick the tires on them and let us know what you think. Thank you. How coupled is the uh, design of the flexibility and group functionality with the need to express that C plus plus So it was given that in 2020 is a C plus plus 17. And it's still an open question about how quickly to future versions of C plus plus given the maturity of all possible C plus plus. Yeah. So all the hypo all the all the groups I, I mentioned here, we we have implementations as just group classes as they are. Uh, the concept we think is the useful thing because it it defines the abstract interface that that's common across all of these things, and that's something we don't really have today. Uh, I mean, potentially in C plus plus ease, you could think of this as like a, a base class that all these groups uh, extend. Uh, but that's just not the way any of that's set up in Sickle today. So, but C++20 does have this concept idea and it does seem like a natural fit as a way to express this type of thing. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, and I think it's, imp how can I say? We should learn from what other program model maybe failed, like for example, in OpenMP, right? At the beginning, it was nice, it was parallel for that they had a team, you know, they have groups of teams, and then they would have league and whatever, and they would never stop because hardware came more and more complex, more and more hierarchic and everything. So I'm, so I think this abstract notion is nice, and I think I, I may be supportive of the fact that maybe users should describe what kind of 
features they want. And after from that, we should be able to derive a group and to tell them, oh, yeah, in this hardware, you can indeed have your global synchronization or yes, in this hardware, you can have this kind of synchronization between these types of group. So maybe I think it's really important to this work and I'm supportive and maybe something a little more dynamic and less static with really an enumeration of group may be a good idea, but I guess it's hard <laughs> to define because the scope is hard. But I think I see it more like we, the user wants some feature and how they can express for each kernel what kind of features they want and how we can derive some of the, yeah, the feature of it, but yeah. Just my two cents. Uh, how do you um, anticipate this functionality to interact with hardware capabilities? Because a lot of this, these features, like they look very nice and they make code simple, but this simplicity can quickly go away if you then need to special case for a lot of different hardware functionality that may or may not be supported on class of hardware that you want to support in your app. Yeah. That's one of those things where I think we just need more experience to see if there is in fact a problem. We don't think there is today because it's been able to be implemented. And it, our implementation, I think is just, we it was based on stuff that was already there in Spear V. We didn't have to add anything new for it, I think. Uh, yeah, we're not sure. Uh, but, and yeah, like the, the hierarchies may be very different for different types of hardware and there may be some that support, you know, you, you can synchronize at this level, but not that level. So implementations will probably need to provide mechanisms to help programmers with that. Like you could certainly provide kind of aliases for certain types of hardware of, you know, these are the kind of roughly fixed types that would exist, but you can express that using these generic mechanisms. Thanks. Thanks. 